Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Mills. I'm the executive director of Global Innovation Institute. Uh, I want to welcome you to our webinar today. This is our June uh, 2023 webinar. And uh, we have these webinars about once a month to try to uh, add additional knowledge insight into the innovation process and add on to everyone's knowledge and, and help develop a cumulative knowledge around business innovation. Um, in the way of introduction, as most of you know, Global Innovation Institute is the world's leading professional certification, business accreditation, and membership association in the field of innovation. We have authorized providers delivering services with us all over the world, and we have uh, individuals who are certified and businesses who are accredited spanning the globe. Uh, so we're really thankful for everyone that uh, participates in our programs and uh, joins us for our webinars. Uh, we're very grateful for your being here. And so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, our guest speaker, and uh, tell you who is with us. So our guest today is Mr. Tim Jakes. Tim is the founder and CEO of Teaming Worldwide, a global innovation and change consultancy based in Saratoga Springs, New York. Teaming Worldwide specializes in innovation and change in large, complex organizations and markets, where it delivers business transformation services that help organizations thrive, including its proprietary intentional innovation methodology. The firm is known for helping clients solve their most complex business challenges by leveraging its intentional creativity methods within otherwise more traditional organizations. Tim himself is an explorer, a thinker, a speaker, and a writer on the topics of innovation, team performance, complex projects, organizational change, and culture. Tim specializes in innovation and change in complex markets and large-scale innovation programs and often speaks to large audiences on these very topics. He is a master facilitator of Teaming Worldwide's Intentional Innovation Methodology. Tim is also the co-author of two books, one being a global standard on project management. Tim holds a bachelor's degree in management information systems from the University of Maryland and is certified as a project management professional, a scrum master, and a change management practitioner. He's also a multi-instrumentalist multi musician <laughs> and an avid swimmer. That's a large word. <laughs> Tim lives in New York with his wife, two grown sons, and two dogs. So today, Tim is going to be talking to us about how to transition from chaotic product roadmaps to powerful disruptive plays by leveraging big future states. This is an important topic for so many organizations, especially those who suffer from a wheel-spinning product culture and instead need to transition toward more rational approaches that build on their organization's innovation assets. Tim will also demonstrate some of the practical tools and approaches from Teaming Worldwide's Intentional Innovation Methodology, which you can use right away. So please join me now, if you will, in welcoming Mr. Tim Jakes. Tim, the floor is all yours. Thank you very, very much, Anthony, and welcome, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, let me share my screen, and we will dive into it. I've got a, I've got a lot of content to share with you today, and these tools are... Um, there we go. There we go. These tools are um, from our intentional innovation toolkit. So, um, but more important than that, um, what I want to share with you today is about how to de risk big plays, big innovations um, in a way that is safe for the organization. Um, so what we do here in my little company is we work with, with organizations that operate in complex environments, um, and, and we help those organizations to make big moves in highly regulated environments, in places where there's, uh, for example, healthcare or in insurance or in um, even in manufacturing, where there's a lot of different moving parts. And so it's less about creating a product and evolving the features of that product. And it's more about creating ecosystems and platforms and meeting the market with something that's truly uh, disruptive and amazing. 
So that's where we play. And um, I love going into this. I've spent a lot of time in the project world as well as in the product world. So I, my company, which is uh, about 10 years old, is sort of merging of these disciplines in a, in a really great way. So let's dive into it. Here's my hypothesis for you. And Anthony, I'll just trust that you'll jump in there uh, with any sort of comments or questions. Please feel free to, to jump to um, interrupt me as, as we go here. Um, no. So, so my hypothesis is this, that when an organization today, when an organization wants substantial growth, a disruptive future state is needed. In other words, incremental improvements rarely these days will yield substantial growth. The innovator's challenge then is to create something that's sustainable, uh, that delivers consistent, repeatable innovations that satisfy the organization's criteria for success. And so therefore, we need a method to de-risk these big future states through a set of tools that create those big future states. So let's let's jump into this and um and just sort of uh, i'm going to walk you through a bunch of tools and graphics and um i will send out a selection of these tools uh to anyone who would like them uh so this this should be really interesting so first concept that i want to talk about is what is a future state well it's a disruptive idea for how the business interacts with com customers, competitors, suppliers, and the world, typically evolved through a series of incremental launches. We like to think of future states differently than, say, a um, kind of a, a release schedule or um, a project scope or something like that. When we are really thinking from an innovation perspective, a future state is this sort of place in the future where we are um, where, where it's a new world. And what we're trying to do is to manifest that new set of conditions so that we are really in control of how those suppliers and customers and, and all those various players are interacting with, with what we do. So let me go into that a little bit more. Let's talk about um, what happened sort of in the 19... 40s, 50s, 60s even, right? What was innovation all about at that point? So when we, when, when management systems started evolving, we came out of sort of the, the um, industrial revolution and got to a place where um, uh, things like branding and advertising were really starting to take shape in their modern forms. What we saw was that there was this um, concept of mass production um, and that innovation really meant yielding incremental solutions. And I'll give you an example. I'm a shoemaker. And um, so I make brown shoes today. And at some point, everybody in the marketplace has brown shoes. So my next move might be to introduce in the same form a black shoe. So now my customers are buying black shoes and maybe refreshing their brown shoes. Um, and then eventually I see a market for an athletic shoe. And then eventually I'm going to a waterproof shoe. And, and it, through each one of these moves, there's a couple of elements to sort of keep, keep a, a hold of. One is that my market tends to get smaller every time I make those incremental moves. Now, it could be that my athletic shoe is a big hit and it reaches some new customers out there, right? Some new people might like that athletic shoe. Um, but typically what, what we see, and especially in, in the modern world today where we are bombarded with these sort of feature upgrades, whether it's in shoes or in software or uh, in automobiles, um, there's a lot of feature enhancement going on, right? And so from a brown shoe to a black shoe to an athletic shoe, we see the markets getting smaller, first of all. And then second of all, what we see is that there is, um, this is a predictable way of operating. Our customers understand what might be coming next and our competitors can see this too. So our competitors can kind of beat us to the market. Different way to look at it is uh, what I would call the Einsteinian 
uh, way of thinking about this, right? So this is more modern innovation, which is mass customization and it's disruptive. <clears throat> what I might think as a shoemaker is, I really want to be involved in lifelong fashion. I want to have a, a bigger wallet share and ultimately a bigger market share. And so how I might start that is to think about, well, what else can I do beyond shoes? So my big, my big play, for an example, would be lifelong fashion. I want to be the clothier for life to my customers. Now, I can't go from making brown and black shoes to being a clothier for life. And so what I need to do is to approach this, this disruptive future state through a series of incremental um, jumps. And the first one might be, I'm going to consolidate shoes. I'm going to talk to my competitors and get their shoes uh, into my store. And then I'm going to move from that because I understand how shoes work. I might also then begin to understand how fashion works. And now I might expand into, let's say, men's fashion um, and maybe even start going into women's fashion. And so I'm learning as I go, as I go from, from shoes at my fingertips to fashion at my fingertips. And then I might start adding in services like a fashion consultant, right? And then beyond that, I might get into uh, VR fittings and alterations, now, you've seen this one before, haven't you? If you have ever ordered Stitch Fix or any of those subscription services, um, this might sound familiar to you. This is a good example of how modern innovation creates these disruptive future states, and they're hard to predict for your competitors, and they are delightful for your customers because they expect uh, it's hard to know what to expect. And when you add in something like fashion at my fingertips, it, it's a convenience and it makes it easier for me to do that. So this is sort of the idea in a nutshell. Why is this important? Because we go from a, uh, this sort of wheel spinning environment where, um, where a brown shoe sales might go way up and then way down, and then black shoes go way up and way down, right? As our competitors begin to copy what we're doing and as our customers tire of that particular product, we see that in this sort of incremental uh, feature enhancement uh, approach, what, you're, what you don't get is sustainable growth. You don't get to a place where you're really expanding uh, the overall volume or customer base. Um, but it tends to be we're, we're keeping our current customers happy and maybe seeing some organic growth. Alternatively, when we look at a, a disruptive future state, we can see that there is growth over time here. And we do that through each one of these increments. And as we're building that, we're seeing an overall growth in volume and in revenue, et cetera. So that is our experience. And this is the heart of our method as we are moving forward, that instead of just having a good idea for the next product, what we really want to aim for is a great future state and then to build towards that. The benefit of this is that we also are de-risking the future through these smaller moves. And that's really the key here. We're getting out of the chaotic rush of, of feature set to feature set, product release to product release. Um, and what we're really starting to do is to build out something that's much bigger and that uh, has some real growth potential to it. And by the way, each one of these is pivotable. So if we get to the my fashion, uh, can, you know, my fashion salon uh, um, uh, phase, the launch two, and we realize, geez, um, it's not really working the way we thought it would, we can pivot that right away and we can start to go in a different direction as needed. So it's, this uses all the same tools uh, that we use in innovation in terms of testing and all of that. So when we talk about enterprise scale innovation, 
we're looking beyond individual products. We're, we're looking beyond even really the toolkits that are in design thinking, right? Design thinking um, is a great set of tools and we use it very liberally in our practice, but um, we see that that set of tools is inadequate when we're really talking about enterprise scale innovation. How do we evolve um, our, our whole organization into something much bigger? So how do we do that then? Well, first, we define the objective criteria to evaluate ideas, products, concepts, um, which builds alignment and saves time and effort. So that's the first step is we build alignment. And I'm going to walk you through each one of these. Second, we create big future states in high energy workshops and analyze these ideas. So we use creativity in a very specific way and we, we apply the, the creative um, methods that all of the uh, sort of professional, um, all, all the large scale uh, innovation companies use. And, and I'll walk you through what that really means. Third, we compete, we complete detailed design, robust testing, de-risking, pivoting, all of that, and hand off into a safe portfolio into other kinds of agile-like um, methods. So, thing to keep in mind here is that there are, there's really three concepts that I'll walk you through today. Um, first is that we're creating some alignment around um, how do we get permission? Second is around creativity. And the third is around moving, making it go. So first tool, I, I promised you three tools today. The first tool is around creating permission to innovate. And we use decision analytics. So here's, here's what, the, this is sort of the, the three methods if you will, and the decision analytics uses a variety of other tools. I won't go in all of, all of the tools today, but I do wanna walk you through a couple. One of the big um, ideas in modern innovation is how do we build the leadership mandate around innovation? We are not gonna go anywhere unless we have our leadership team on point for, um, what is what does our future state look like? So here's how we sort of look at it. The leadership commitments um, should be we should be talking about them at each one of these levels, right? So are we are we as an organization going to disrupt the world? Um, you know, then let's talk about what that really means. Are we remaking the industry in some way? Are we introducing brand new ways of operating? Are we going to innovate? in our category, right? Are we gonna create some new and wonderful products and services and new ways of seeing uh, how you can solve that problem at the category level? Are we in it to improve, right? So at the product service level, are we in it to develop new features and new functions that will delight our customers? And finally, are we in it to harvest, right? And there we're really looking at margin or how do we make the most efficient, most um, uh, elastic kind of service that can really flex for the for the individual um, user of this. And there we're going for margin. So on this side, we see legacy and impact. And over here is the commitment. So the idea is that we want to first get really clear about that, because if if I, as a product manager or an innova chief innovation officer, I'm thinking, I want to go out and disrupt the world. But the rest of my leadership team is thinking, no, that's not really us. We're going we're gonna to stick right in here because um, that's our risk tolerance. We need to have those tough discussions ahead of time and come to consensus. Um, and that's a huge, huge piece to um, resolve. So how do we do that? Well, let me walk you through one of the um, one of the key tools that we use, and it's, it looks very simple, and it's deceptively difficult and and insightful and wonderful. So we use this thing called a portfolio view, which is what you're looking at, and it's just you know if you can see here, it is really a a product life cycle. So time is going this way, right? Products get born over here. 
they grow, they mature, and then they decline, right? And every product has this, every product sort of goes through this phase, their introduction, growth, um, maturity, and decline. And, and you can see here that there's, there's sort of components with it, right? You know, in, in growth, everyone's buying it. In maturity, everyone's bought it. Um, and that this area right here, you see it's the highest volume or market share. This, this axis can be can change depending on what, what specific scenario we're looking at. But you can see that the degree of in, innovation here is pretty low, right? Um, it's tending towards low, depending on where in maturity you are. But this also tends to be the highest. Th this is the cash cows, all right? And I'll walk you through an example here. So I'm that shoemaker again, right? And I want to look at my products and understand where they are. So in this method, what, what we do is we actually go and look at revenues. And we start to map revenues to where these products are today in their current environment. So we can see here that there are smart shoes that are just, you know, right, they're still in the lab bench, they're getting worked on, maybe prototyping, haven't yet really launched them large scale. We've got washables that are really, they're, they're washable shoes, they get, they can go out and, and they're, they're selling like crazy. And then we've got weekends, weekenders, all purpose loafers, wet wear, right? So um, these kinds of things are our mainstay products. We we sell a lot of them. We replace them for customers. So customers are wearing up the old ones and buying them again. Um, and that represents in this model, 79% of our revenues. All this is made up, by the way. And then boaters, uh, which are like shoes for boating and croc knockoffs, those rubberized shoes, um, this, these are in decline. And we can tell that because the revenue is going down, et cetera. Now, what's interesting about a model like this is that we now can start to make decisions at the product level. How do I take this boater? Because we have a manufacturing line and a supply chain dedicated to that and begin to move this back this way. We can begin to understand and make decisions around this. Can we take this and refresh it somehow so that it comes back over here into either growth or maturity? Or alternately, do we want to enable its decline and slowly see it off into the sunset? So the first sort of point of, of agreement that we wanna to get to is around where are we today with these various products? That's at the product level. At the market level, then, I want to look at some of my competitors, right? ThreadUp and Smart Closet and Stitch Fix are among my biggest ones. And here I can see that there are gaps in the marketplace. Um, I also see over here a, retail, a couple of retail stores and a big department store. And they're not giving us much in terms of competition, but I see them and they, you know, these guys are, are refreshing their lines, right? But they don't sell much in the way of shoes, but that's what they're doing. These guys then, I, you know, we can see what they're offering into the marketplace and, and where they're going. And down here are the are four different types of innovation, leaping, leading, improving, and enabling. So once we've mapped this out and understood where the gaps are, I can then begin to understand how that plays with, with our innovation types. So leaping is really new to the world. It redefines the industry, right? So um, here we might think about digital fabric, right? So fabric that can change its color or um, you know, and 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 uh, or change its its elasticity, right? Um, and these are very high risk and high reward and high innovation. A lot of startups play in this space. Leading innovation is new to the space. It redefines the business and can have some impact on the industry. So this might be something like wear once apparel, or it could be on the other end. Wear a thousand times apparel without cleaning, like never clean it. This is much lower risk 
and, but still relatively high in terms of its innovation, right? What we have to apply to it. Improving then, we're looking at the features, the benefits. How do we get out to the seg into other segments? How do we move into adjacent markets? How do we innovate in our branding? Um, these kinds of things. And this is, again, lower rate. This kind might be working with our current products um, and extending them out. So one-stop clothing. And then finally, our enabling. And this is more efficiency, capacity, margin. So here we, we might just be looking at how can we make the most of our current supply lines, our current supply chain, and offer up new styles, um, get better, better pricing, et cetera. Typically, enabling and improving are not going to drive new customer uh, growth or very limited new customer growth. Where you're going to get to new customer growth is on the this side of improving, right, where you're really starting to do something that's different and, and wonderful and into the leading space. And, you know, a, a common and typical example might be Apple, right? So if you're going to make a feature improvement to the iPad, um, probably not going to see people come over to the iPad from their other, you know, from their Samsung device, let's say. Um, whereas if you were to create a whole new of a virtual iPad or something that's completely unthought of, that's that's a more of a leading or a leaping kind of innovation, um, uh, then you might see some of those Samsung users jumping over into that market space. So we look, we tend to do a lot of analysis around that and to think about how do we build innovations then, go right here and, oops, and here, how do we then start to map these areas in here and understand what kind of products are we building and where are the investments? Where where are we? What kind of innovation and therefore what kind of investment, et cetera? We haven't yet even yet started talking about the ideas, the specific innovations. All we're really doing is creating a kind of an analytical view of what we think is needed, right? And what this might suggest is we're not gonna update over here. What we're really gonna do is start to update over here and move that forward. And it doesn't always it doesn't always have to be that. There are many different views of an of a portfolio. Um, and so we as we work with portfolios, we generate many of these and look at the what ifs and try to determine um, is it better to refresh some of these products and to introduce some new things? Do we make partnerships with some startups and get some things way out here in introduction? So you can really start to have a very rich conversation about what the future might look like when you're looking at it sort of holistically in this fashion. So the game changer number one is start consensus building with an inarguable view of your portfolio. You need an analytical case to really understand where are we today and where do we want to be? What are those opportunities like out there? What's the field that we want to be talking about? So it's, uh, let, let me keep going here. Um, Anthony, please, if there are any questions, please feel free to jump in. So far, so good, carry on. Okay. So the second tool I wanna introduce to you then is how to actually create the big future state. So we spend, um, once we've created all the analytics up front, we know now that it's safe to really think about a future state because we're going to target our thinking into certain areas. And so we spend a lot of time profiling the teams, understanding how do they think, what are the ways that, that they think we want a great mix of critical thinkers and creative thinkers. And we actually use a custom tool for that, that we um, help our, our customers understand at the team level, how they think and what they do. So we begin the process um, by sort of building future states, which is over here on the right. And um, the way we get to those future states is you can see by these, you know, this is a construction and deconstruction method. Um, 
we begin by using many different types of thinking. We call these genius thinking patterns. And this is an approach to getting the most creativity out of your team. We then uh, classify and narrow those into building block and disruptives. And then those eventually work their way into the pipeline. And then we finally get into future states. All of this falls into this context of a creative agenda. And so what we do is we, we look at gen all those seven genius thinking patterns, things like emerging trends and core uh, unmet core needs. We create, and out of that, we create ideas, idea themes, building blocks, and disruptive ideas. And they all sort of churn their way through in a typical two to three day session, just as a point of reference, we're creating 450 ideas, sometimes up to 800 ideas. Um, uh, we then create 100 merged and purged ideas. We're linking them and building them. We, we identify the themes. Um, we do the best building block ideas and the best disruptive ideas. And out of all of that work comes five potential, high potential future states. So this is really the work of what a sort of a professional innovation team might do in a large corporation. You are working through this process. You're building and deconstructing and building and deconstructing and continuously doing that until you're really getting to sort of the three highest potential future states. And then three to five innovations in a series that lead to each one of those future states. So how does that work? So we have, as we're building them out using those seven genius thinking patterns, and by the way, let me just talk about maybe one of those seven genius thinking patterns. One of those is opposition, and this is a common technique used in innovation. We, we ask people to think of the opposite, right? So here's a cup. Let's you know brainstorm 10 ways uh, that you can to invent the opposite of a cup. Right, so what does that look like? Well, a con concave or convex cup, a uh, cup with no sides, uh, a cup that also is a flower pot. Right, so uh, you just keep going and keep thinking and ideating through this, and um, and those ideas then start to emerge. Um, and today we can also use Chat GPT and AI to help spur that. Um, and so, and we do, and it's it's fascinating what what we come up with. So, um, out of that come what we call building blocks. And if we were that shoemaker again, we might come up with things like automated alterations, disposable shoes, fashion and function partnerships, fash, uh, functional clothing brands, automated alterations. Again. Um, we might have some disruptive ideas as well, right? Like click your heels, Dorothy shoes. Maybe when you click your heels three times, something amazing happens. You get transported or your phone starts to ring or something. Three speed travel shoes, right? So traveling is always a problem for people. I need to bring all different shoes. Maybe what I need is one pair of shoes that can change every time I go somewhere. So, et cetera, you see these, these different kinds of concepts. We would have identified these as disruptive and then come up with three of those that are disruptive. So this is the process. This is the process of building, deconstructing, reviewing, building it again, and finally deconstructing it. And when we get to where we have these sort of future states, we're then deconstructing it even further and saying, okay, for each one of those future states, each one of those big disruptive ideas, let's give it three different definitions. And let's really kind of churn that soil. Let's really see what's in there and find the really big pieces that are gonna drive our growth. I will say this to each and every one of you, if you come from an engineering world, if you come from a, a, an organization that's not, you don't see as particularly creative, there is a lot of creativity locked into your organization. I, we work a lot with 
engineering centric organizations, right? Big electric utilities and other kinds of places like that. And here, um, the, the, the techniques of using uh, thinking patterns and a creative agenda, um, it, th these are really important tools to helping to drive deeper levels of creativity in the organization and identifying the different types of, of players that you have on the creative spectrum and on the critical spectrum. So the game changer here is your organization has the capacity for deep creativity. It just needs to be tapped. Deep creativity equals big futures. We spend a lot of time thinking about deep, uh, about like strategy, right? And about um, creating objectives and goals and these, these sort of um, uh, strategic plans that are going to drive our growth. The, the piece that we find is missing a lot in that strategic planning process is the creative part. When, when we are not tapping into our organization's creativity to build out a future state, um, we tend to come up with rehashes of what we've already done, or we, um, we just don't go as far as we could. And so the organization starts to become predictable and it starts to wane and it starts to not, not operate so well. So that's the second tool is all around creativity. Third tool then is how do we test, pivot and launch? And here we use things like an innovation series an infrastructure uh, evolution and client preferred pilot to toolkit. So we, we like to be very flexible. We use design thinking a lot, all of this stuff. So let me just give you um, at least one quick tool here. We've got our future state. And what we want to do then is to begin to evolve towards that future state. And so we look at evolution across a number of different dimensions. First of all, each element in the future state should have a value proposition. Every single one should have a, 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 a notable value proposition that changes. And each one of these may have a, its own business model canvas done, right? Because we're gonna be reaching our clients in new and different ways. So the value proposition is super important because it's all about how do I extend what we're doing into the next launch? How do I expand that value proposition as we go through? We look at the specific products and services involved in each launch. So in a, in a typical environment where a company might say, geez, we're going to offer this new product and service, that tends to be the first launch in future state thinking. So an in, in intentional innovation, that what a lot of companies end up with tends to just be the first part of this. So it's the core products and services, and then we expand those as we go through. Each one of these then represents an investment. It's de-risk because we're able to pivot. We're able to grow our capabilities at each step, et cetera. We then talk about launch essentials. So what's the critical infrastructure that needs to be in place in order for us to do that? Um, so if we were serving up clothing, the critical infrastructure might include things like supply chain, uh, might include a, an algorithm for selecting the clothing, right? Stitch Fix uses this incredible AI-driven algorithm that maps makers of clothing and, and locations of supply points to the locations of the customers so that the shipping costs can be minimized. So all of these different, uh, among other things, I mean, there, there's a lot more to it than that, but the launch essentials look at how the, the actual pieces of how do we deliver that value proposition. And then finally, and maybe this is firstly, what does the customer say? What's the user story? You know, yesterday I, I could only get shoes, but today I don't even have to go to the store. Now I can get clothing. Um, it's really exciting, right? So that's what they might say here. And we want them to sort of have a new user story at every turn. So the game changer here is that we create the bigs, the big transformational pieces through a series of small increments. 
And that is how we de-risk the future. And we, we build it like that because we want to be able to pivot and grow our capabilities and learn and all that stuff. So we've done this for a whole bunch of brands. I don't mean to, to make this an ad per se, but, but just to say that this process actually works um, and we've done that. Um, and so I, I'm so happy that we could share some of these tools with you. Um, these are really, really powerful. They've been around for um, for a long time. And what we've done is, is created this into this integrated toolkit and it works. So Anthony, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I hope that this was value added. I'd love to answer any questions or talk with anyone. Yes, and our pleasure, uh, Tim, very much so. So yeah, we'd like to transition now into some question and answer. So we invite everyone to, um, you know, if you have questions for Tim or comments, you can put them into the uh, chat box or you can uh, turn on your camera and microphone and feel free to jump in and let's make this conversational and so forth. Let me kick it off, uh, Tim, with some couple of questions of my own. And then while I'm asking you that, uh, perhaps some others will have some questions as well. So in thinking about the uh, the big future state and, and the user story, uh, and in one of the early slides you showed, you know, going from from being really about products to other things, it seemed to me to be very parallel to the concept of the experience economy, where we're moving from products to services to experiences. And is that in your experience with this method, does that tend to be where the trajectory goes toward moving away from just being about products to being more about services and ultimately experiences for your customer? Yeah, I mean, all too often today, and I apologize for this background noise. I'm not sure if you can hear it. Um, we're not hearing it. We're, we're oh, just hearing good. It. Okay. There just happens to be somebody grinding stone outside my window just right at this moment. So, <laughs> um, so I think what we see um, is that companies who are interested in making a bigger play are all, almost always are attracted to the sort of concept of a platform. And so the, you know, when we are talking about a platform, we're talking about creating consumers and producers and connecting them through an interface, typically digital. Um, and so in that sense, we tend to focus a lot on what does your platform look like and what's the ecosystem around that? How do we, um, create community around that. Um, all, all too often today, in, especially in complex marketplaces, um, I need to justify my purchases. I need, to, I, I need to know that the thing that I'm buying is not standalone. It's not, you know, and that it, it fits in with the other things that I have. So in that sense, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, almost like an ecosystem perspective. Like how does this fit yeah. in with, with other aspects of my, my, uh, my world? Yeah. So one of the questions that uh, Walid has shared with us is, how do you reconcile innovation strategy with corporate strategy? What if the corporate strategy doesn't provide a clear direction? Great question. Thank you, Walid. So I will tell you, in my experience, and this comes as somebody who has developed a lot of strategies for a lot of different customers, um, I think that corporate strategies oftentimes are thin. They do not address the, the really the core drivers. Um, you know, we, I now see a, a lot of um, interest in doing things like competitive strategies um, uh, and building out sort of more targeted strategies to get at that. So these tools, in my mind, building out a future state is almost a replacement for strategy. Um, strategy to me is, is almost purely analytical. What you end up with at the end of a strategic planning process is goals and objectives and actions and tactics, and it's overwhelming list of things to do. And while there is going to be a lot to do out of a future state trajectory out of that kind of a planning process, what you're really tapping into here, the missing element is the creativity. We are uh, inherently building something new. And therefore, um, from that, we mobilize our assets around that. And so it's a very different conversation. And it, it can work in con uh, 
in concert with a strategy or it can replace it. And we've, we've done it both ways. Interesting. You know, I, I think you're right that a lot of corporate strategies are very thin and don't really get at the the heart of what they need to get to. And, you know, the, the starting place, actually, I was in a strategy discussion earlier this week about strategy methodologies. And the starting place is always what's the aspiration of the organization, you know, the long term yeah. aspiration. <laughs> And, and, you know, some organizations really haven't defined that very well. You know, you know, yeah, we have, we have a identity, right. And we have, might have, a, we might say we have a vision, but really you have to distill that down specifically. What are your aspirations in this area and that area? And then really how do these strategies support, support those aspirations? Most traditional strategic planning efforts really just kind of come at it from the backside, like, well, here, here we think these are linear extrapolations of current trends. We just need to keep, you know, marching to that drumbeat. When that really yeah. doesn't address any real aspiration. So I think yeah, you're that, that's a great point, Anthony. And I, I think that, um, you know, it's not to knock. There are some great strategic planners and great strategic plans out there. It's a 50 to 70 year old tool in the business setting. And I think for a lot of people, it's very predictable. And it's it, we all tend to go to sleep a little bit when we engage in that process, because you know it's going to be a bunch of meetings, you know, and, and we're going to be slicing and dicing a lot of data. Um, and so I think for organizations that don't do it very well, it's really not great at all. There are some organizations that really know how to do it well and they they use it to their advantage. So it's not a knock on the whole thing, but it's really like a lot of a lot of places sort of see it as like list making and you know setting some very thin goals for themselves. So right. and, I, and I think what's missing is is really a real true aspiration about how we shape the future and what is that future state user story and 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 that's just often missing as an element of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, which to me is kind of the North Star in the process. Let me shift gears a little bit. So Professor Ahmed Balul, he, he has a question for us, and his question is this. Are these tools also valid and applicable for the agriculture or agribusiness among different sectors and countries, particularly developing and uh, both developing and developed countries? So agriculture and agribusiness applicability. Yeah, sure. So this method has been used in Africa, um, in, um, <clears throat> with Heifer International, um, which it, you know, so, so, uh, Heifer International is an international nonprofit and, um, they were looking at, you know, how can we, um, extend the life of our products so that they can get further to, to, to marketplaces that are further out, um, and to really to villages that are further out. Um, and so a lot of those artifacts are still at work. A lot of those methods are still at work for how do we store and transport um, in a in a environment where there's not electricity and there's not um, uh, uh, and and transport times can be very slow. So how do we store? How do we how do we um, process the the various um, livestock and and poultry and dairy products? So that's an example of one. Um, I think that that um, in general, yeah, this this um, toolkit is really designed to be used in a kind of a wide range of settings. Yeah. Okay, very good. So Walid has another question for us. I think this is a great question because it really gets into a little bit of the cultural application of this process inside of organizations. And and so here here's this question. It's it's kind of a long one, so just listen carefully. Okay. How can you avoid internal breeding where operational people managers are asked to contribute to what they would have done before how can you reach out to the front lines of the organization do their management allow you to search deeply inside or outside the organization and incorporate those type of people into the process that's great great question thank you for that um so uh, my experience in, in this is that um organizations are different and some of it has to do with their culture, right? So organizations that tend to be hierarchical and have strong chain of command um, suggests that you know the, the work there is different than in a, an organization that is primarily about um, doing creativity, doing product development kinds of activities and executing on, on new product um, approaches. So I think it differs by organization, number one. 
Um, but to your specific question, how can you reach out to the front lines? What we do is we like to construct the work. The work gets done in teams always. And my company is Teaming Worldwide, and it's named Teaming Worldwide for a reason. We are strong believers that our best work happens in teams. And so we will we can construct teams um, that pull in some of those frontline workers um, and gives a voice to that where it's needed. Sometimes it's just working with the executives um, in, in this sort of developing a future state approach, a lot of what happens up front is in the analytics part of it is getting the input from the various type, you know, the departments or the various functions within the organization to better. And sometimes that's done through survey or through focus group interviews, et cetera. Um, and, and it has to be done, right? These listening sessions are so important to getting the perspective. Ultimately, though, a small team is needed to do the work. We can't include everybody in it um, because we want the, the visioning around the future state to be very potent. And so we select based on, not on function, not on executive level, we, we select typically based on an evaluation of sort of cognitive diversity, right? So that is looking across those, those two spectrums of creative and critical thinking. And we select folks who sort of have high levels of, of each one of those and of both to create a team that we think will get the job done. It's an excellent point, Jim. You know, cognitive diversity, I, I can't emphasize it enough how important that is into the creative process to get together a group of people who think differently, who look at the world differently, have different perspectives and different ways of processing information, because that sort of cognitive diversity tends to really, I think, look at a situation from a lot of different angles and brings a lot of different perspectives. In the end, when you put all that together, it just tends to result in, you know, a lot of ahas and 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 fresh. Yeah. Clean. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Great. Absolutely. So much more so than pulling the sales team together or pulling the executives together even. You know, a lot of times executive teams we see make the worst teams because they, they what, what makes a great executive doesn't necessarily make for a great uh, visionary of a future state. So we, it's really important to be sort of um, interacting with all the different parts of the organization and identifying who are those people who we think could really have a fresh perspective on what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. That's it's a great point. And 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 sometimes you know that there are profiling tools you can use to identify people's ways of thinking and perceiving. But ultimately, at the end of the day, that's what you want to bring together is different different perspectives and different uh, yep. uh, ways of approaching the problem. So let's shift gears back uh, from inside the organization back to outside. A couple of questions uh, to sort of start wrapping things up, like like. My question is, okay, we talked about the, the big future state and the, and the, the future state uh, user story. Yeah. And that's great for one specific you know, market segment. But what about organizations that are dealing with 20 different market segments? You know, maybe they're business units. You know, are you ten, do you tend to just do this business unit by business unit for one specific market segment? Or do you try to do this for the whole organization and all of their market segments? Sure. Um in in large corporations, right? So corporations with let's say more than twenty thousand people, um, we would we we typically have done this in a unit by unit because they're oftentimes going into different markets, yeah. um, right? So so a Unilever or a GE, one of these large scale companies like that, um, in in sort of companies that are um, smaller than that, um, it is variable. It really varies. Um, right now we're doing some work. Uh, uh, we are working in a, in a huge US government entity that um, is not, um, we're, we're only in one small part of it. We're also working for a healthcare system that has about 15,000 people in it. And there we're working at the very top talking with a lot of different people and it's, it's uh, gonna change the whole system. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to see this. It doesn't have to be enterprise change. Future state thinking can begin at the 
business unit level. The key is that it has to be, we have to have that alignment um, from the people who, who are making the decisions. Without that alignment, these big future states just sound crazy. They just sound like crazy talk. So we need to sort of get a sense that these folks are bought into what the future is going to look like. And then we can have talks about how do we get there? How do we de-risk that? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Walid asks, to do the market analysis, you really need market insight. But what if your client doesn't have that knowledge and neither do you? So you Great start question. out, you don't have the data and the insight you need. What, what do you do there? Yeah. So we do a lot of research ourselves and, and our clients do too. Um, we tend to look for, you know, compound annual growth rates uh, within um, within specific products, product lines, uh, industry lines. Um, truth be told, we don't do a, a really like extensive amount of that kind of research. And I'll tell you why. Um, when we, we have done that before, but what we find is that too much data really sinks the ship. Um, because it, it just, we, we can start interpreting the data in different ways. What we really want to do is get a, 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 a higher ish level view of where is this particular space going right now? Is it in growth? How big is the growth? Is it in, you know, above 9% tends to be very high growth. Um, somewhere between three and nine can be sort of moderate, normal growth. And underneath that is slow. And there may be opportunities in any one of those. So getting that sort of high level tent pole view of the marketplace is really helpful. Much more data than that, which it, you know, it happens. And, and sometimes you have to process through more um, or do specific deep dives into specific questions. Those are, we, we do that as needed. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, understanding where the overall market is going and, and the growth rate and, and projected growth rate in the future and how long that's going to last. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what you care about. I mean, once you start getting into product line by product line, that's really distilling into a level of detail that can probably bog the process down a little bit. And I don't think that's usually where you want to do the process. Yeah, and and also you get to the you know I think what we love to focus on is the the voice of the customer, right? So we want to get to a place where we're really getting to understanding the buyers and the users and figuring out what's going to make them be attracted to this new environment, um, you know, launch one, launch two, et cetera. And so all that data does is points us in the right direction and also tells us where not to go. Mm -hmm. um, and and then from there, we we really want to focus on what is you know what what will this do in terms of attracting new customers? Right. And and I want to have one last question, and then we'll wrap it up. You remember the pyramid you showed us, and at the very top was disrupt. Right now, mm -hmm. what if what if our aspiration is we really we want to radically change this thing? We want to disrupt it. To, in a situation like that, there's not going to be data for what we're thinking of, where we're thinking about going. So obviously the risk is higher. Is there a specific uh, approach you, you use to try to deal with the uncertainty involved? In yes. That yes. We go to universities. We go to startups. We look at emerging technologies up in this disrupt land. We want to understand what are the things that are that are five years out right now um, you know, if it's in if it's in wind and energy technologies, battery technologies, if it's in healthcare, um, what are the things that are not yet coming out that we can begin to look at either specifically or as a parallel to what we want to do? Right. So yeah, so really you're kind of looking at a lot of trends and you know, technology trends, societal trends, and so forth, and see. Do the trend indicators and the signposts that we may have defined indicate this is uh, the right direction to move in direction? Yeah, and it's high risk. And, you know, it's all up in this area, right up in here, introduction. And so typically, you know, in large companies, you might have 10, 20, 100 little bets going on here, right? And some of those are going to look like startups. Some of those are going to be joint ventures. Some of those might be our R&D department. So we're going to have a lot of things happening up here. And a 
few of those are going to start into growth. We're going to allow, you know, but a lot of the other ones, we're just going to hold on to the intellectual property and try to use it at a later date, combine it with some other things, et cetera. Right. And I imagine you encourage them to have a portfolio of initiatives that there are some big bets in there. Obviously, the majority thing is going to be incremental, but you don't want to go, you don't want to be without any kind of, you know, big bets at some point. Exactly. Right? I mean, that's the whole rationale behind this idea of sort of, of, of kind of gap thinking. And, and so we end up producing a lot of these portfolios because you want to see, geez, do we need a portfolio that just protects our mature products? Okay. Do we need a, a portfolio that's going to enable the decline of some products, or maybe we're just going to go all in and go for growth. So there's, you know, and it, it, some of that depends on where is the industry going? Um, you know, uh, are we in a declining industry right now? So what are the things that we would want to do there? That's that's a great point. And obviously, if they're in a declining industry, they, they've got an existential issue to, to deal with and address. Yeah. So, so with that, I think we'll wrap it up. We're at the top of the hour. We'll wrap it up for today. And I just want to thank you, Tim, uh, Mr. Tim thank Jakes. Thank you so Tim much. For being our guest today. Thank you so much. And I believe everyone appreciated. And I want to thank all of uh, our participants who participated today and, and those of you who are watching the recording. Thank you for tuning in and, and hearing about this. Uh, we look forward to hearing each from each of you in the future. And Tim, if, if people want to get in touch with you in the future, uh, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Tim at teamingworldwide.com. And uh, yeah, slides will be available, as you said, Anthony. So we'll I'll, I'll sort of shrink down the slides a little bit. Uh, so I'll give you the tools um, and I'll have some contact info in there. I'd love to hear from anyone. All right. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye.